All right. Good morning, everyone. You guys hear me in the back? Perfect. Uh, so this talk is called Bug Hunting in Router OS. Um, but I probably should have named this talk too much about protocols. Um, but none of you were woken up this early. We're already a small crowd, so um, it's good I tricked you to get in here. So uh, here we go. Now before we get going, uh, I want you all to know that the slides and the code that I referenced in this talk, it's already up on GitHub. Uh, I made this uh, repository public just this morning. Uh, so if you get bored of me mapping JSON to binary, uh, feel free to just hop on GitHub, pull that down, and jump ahead. Now this talk is broken down into four parts. Uh, in part one, I'll start off by introducing myself and Router OS. Uh, in part two, I'll spend some time explaining how you can root Router OS both VMs. Because um, so when you're bug hunting, having access to the file system, being able to run tools like GDB is pretty important. Um, part three, we'll talk about the message protocol. And we'll be in that section for quite a while, but just know that it's really fundamental for part four, where we're going to talk about three different bugs. So, starting with the introduction. My name is Jake Baines. Uh, I often use the handle Albino Lobster. And that's why that guy's up there. Uh, I currently work at Tenable as a senior research engineer, and I'm the team lead of the Zero Day Research Group. Uh, bug hunting in router OS is a really generic title, so you might be wondering what you're actually going to learn here. Um, from my point of view, this talk is purely practical. It's kind of a dummy's guide to hacking router OS. Uh, after this talk, you'll be able to root VM. You know how to communicate over 480 and 8291. You'll understand how the Nova binaries relate to the message protocol. And you'll have a boatload of bad C++ code to read and possibly even use. Uh, and most importantly, for my own ego, uh, I'm going to share with you a brand new vulnerability uh, that we can all play with. But before you learn all that, let me start at the beginning. What is Router OS? Now, Router OS is the operating system used on a variety of micro switches, routers, and access points. And although it's not really the operating system, devices that actually run Linux, Router OS is a whole bunch of binaries and kernel modules that run in that context. But either way, Router OS ships on a really wide variety of hardware. You can see some samples here. Um, we have everything from edge routers uh, to wireless access points. They can be used in the enterprise or at home. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, these devices are fairly well known for being cheap. Now, sort of important to know Microtech churns out router OS releases like it's nobody's business. Uh, in fact, I probably updated this slide about 10 times and just gave up last week. Um, but suffice to say, uh, they keep four major branches going. Uh, legacy, a long-term, a stable, and a beta. Now, to get an idea of what's actually out there in the wild, I hopped on Shodan, and uh, I just looked at FTP banners, which... We all know Shodan isn't perfect, and perhaps looking at FTP banners uh, is a little unfair for the, the type of uh, administrator that keeps their FTP open to the world on the router probably isn't patching. Um, but I think this gives us a basic idea of what's out there. You know, a whole lot of uh, stable, nearly equal amounts of, of long-term and legacy. Um, bizarrely, there's uh, measurable amounts of uh, the beta releases, which is actually a release candidate code, which I wouldn't run on my router. Um, and finally, there was measurable amounts of 4.x. The last 4.x release was seven years ago. So, it's not great. So, in the last year and a half, there's been a lot of excitement about router OS in the news. Which is mostly bad news for Microsoft. It was pretty interesting to us. Um, there are two different threat actors currently in the wild. A slingshot APT and VPN filter. There are a couple of big vulnerabilities that have come out. Uh, Shemay Red was an unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability alluded to in Vault 7, uh, and a researcher has since written a POC for it. And then there's CVE 2018-14847, and that's actively being exploited for nefarious activities uh, as I speak. Uh, kind of interesting, MicroTick was recently added to Zerodium, so if you're looking for a payout, you might want to listen. 
and I'm not the first to present my critique research. And I'm trying to avoid covering these, this old research. It's good to show what it's already out there. Uh, rooting the Microsoft Crowders was previously presented at Shaw 2017. And while I'd love to pronounce that gentleman's name, um, I would butcher it and uh, not only embarrass myself, but maybe him. But either way, uh, both his talk and his GitHub repository were super useful for the me. Uh, and while tools written up by Lorenzo, which are all built in vulnerability, uh, they weren't necessarily useful for my purposes. Uh, Documents get infected by the left itself. And finally, just last week, uh, Power released a uh, Winbox Wireshark protection. Kind of stealing some of my research. All right. So you know a little about me. You know a little bit about Router OS. So let's move on to rooting the devices. Now this topic's really important, as I said, because when you're actually bug hunting, the ability to collect core dumps, attach GDB, or simply lists which binaries are on which core is pretty fundamental. So here we go. To start, we need something to test on. Unfortunately, Router OS can be virtualized. You can go to Microchip's website and download any version from the last eight years, which is all the way back to 4.10. In this slide, you can see I've created a VM with a 6.40.9 ISO. Now, unfortunately, the shells offered on the console, Telnet, and SSH are totally useless to us as bug hunters. Those shells are, they only process router OS commands. They don't provide any access to Linux or BusyBox shell or the underlying file system. Uh, it's almost like they don't want us to have a real shell. But of course, developers want real shells too. So fortunately, the Microtech developers have our back and they insert a back door. But before we get all excited, this back door requires a specific file be present on the file system. And in normal cases, users don't have access to this part of the file system, so that's probably all right. Now, for whatever reason, Microtech has changed this behavior over time. Um, there are three major versions of the backdoor, uh, so I'm going to run you through those. In 6.40.9, which is a long-term release, you'll find the pictured code blocks in nova slash bin slash login. Now, I couldn't put the full logic in the slides, but the gist is this. Is the login user's name devel? If so, does the file devel-login exist in dev? in Nova slash Etsy? Uh, if so, is logging in user using the admin password? If so, drop down into a big box shop. Now the logic in 6.41.4, which is a stable release, is similar except now some of the logic lives in the view message. You can see in the slides that after the login binary determines the user is the bell, it makes a call to a library function called has option package, which in turn calls a function called has package, with a string option as a parameter. And has package just checks the parameter exists in the package directory. So the backdoor file for this version is package slash option. Now from 6.42 upwards, the backdoor logic is the same as 6.41.4, except has package has extra checks. And specifically, it verifies that package slash option has a file system type of squashfs, or that a symlink is pointing to the bundle directory. While that doesn't sound problematic, you'll see in a few slides that it is. So, now that we know what the backdoor file is, how do we actually create it? Because, like I said, normal users don't have access to the underlying file system. But that's where virtualization really helps us. We can just boot the VM into a live CD, mount the file system, and create files as needed. Now, I don't fully understand Red OS's file system overlay, and uh, I've not seen other uh, researchers describe rooting the VM like, quite like I do, but this is how I do it. I drop a sim link to the root directory in the mounted file system rw .sys directory, and this is the directory that FTP has access to. And after rebooting the, the device, I can then FTP in, traverse the sim link, and create a backdoor file using link dirt. It's also a really good opportunity to drop a uh, busy box and GDB server on the system. Uh, it's really important to drop a new busy box because 
Uh, the BusyBox on these systems is notorious for lacking features, like missing LS commands and such. Now in this slide, you can actually see me logged in as the Debel user. Again, I dropped right to the BusyBox shell. But before we get too excited, we have to remember that in 6.42 and up, uh, they had, the changes were made to check file system types. In those newer versions, the file type has to be squashfs. As you can see in this slide, my backdoor method creates a file with a file system type of tempfs. So these newer versions, uh, we need to find another way to get root. So fortunately, router OS has an init script that will execute anything in the rw slash defconf file. And as written, I think they want to provide bin slash gosh with parameters. Um, for those that are excited that gosh might be the go shell, it is unfortunately not. The sim link will uh, log in binary. But either way, there's nothing stopping us from adding commands after bin slash gosh has been executed. So in this slide, you can see I've booted into the live CD again. I've echoed commands to rw slash defconf. The commands will start to come out to tell net on port 1270 using a bin box that I put in the rw slash diff. Um, so sadly that we've moved on from the backdoor file for the new version, but the result is the same. After rebooting, all you need to do is connect. And this is a picture of 6.43. Okay. We can root all versions of the router OSVM, and that's that's pretty useful. But as bug hunters, what we really want to be doing is hunting bugs. So let's move on to that fun stuff. And let's start with an NMAP scan. We immediately find a good amount of attack surface. You see the FTP is open. There are six different management ports, SSH, Telnet, HTTP, uh, Windbox is on 8291. And there are two mic MicroTix API ports, uh, 8728 and 8729. And the bandwidth server is open on 2000. Now, I'm a sucker for both familiarity and low-hanging bugs. So like many, I go straight to the HTTP interface. Because this traffic is a little weird, um, it's just posting over and over again to JF proxy. The data doesn't really look normal, um, possibly encrypted. And the content type of message, which I'm pretty sure is not like a conventional thing. Um, so it leaves me asking, what's going on here? Now we know the browser is sending post requests, so there must be some logic on the client side. Uh, that controls the behavior. It's just a matter of tracking down where the browser got that logic. Now, looking at the early stages of the connection, uh, we see webfig slash master.js that's highlighted here. Uh, and that seems like an interesting candidate. And it turns out uh, it is an interesting candidate. It's the code that's actually making the post request to JS proxy. Um, and it's about 17,000 lines of JavaScript. In this slide, you can see some of the HTTP post requests to JS proxy. I highlighted them, um, as well as some authentication logic. Now, as it turns out, they've implemented MS chat v2 key derivation and RP4 encryption in JavaScript, uh, which seems like a really odd choice to me. Uh, TLS seems much easier, but at least these algorithms are very familiar. Uh, RFC 2079 is nearly 18 years old now. Uh, so what are our steps forward from here? We want to explore this interface, but the communication is hidden behind custom encryption. The obvious answer to me, at least, is that we need to write a tool to decrypt this traffic. So before we can decrypt anything, we need to know how the key negotiation works. We can see here that it starts with the client sending an empty HTTP post request. In doing some unpictured RE, we know that the service response should contain 4 bytes of session ID, 4 bytes of sequence number, and 16 bytes of challenge text, which adds up to 24 bytes. But you can also see in this slide that the content length in the HTTP response is 37 bytes. So for a little while there, I was wondering, again, what's going on? Well, it turns out that everything is encoded into UTF-8 code points, so the size of the payload is always going to be variable. This is just a quick example of decoding the code points. Uh, you see everything sanely goes down to exactly what I said, 4, 4, 16. 
Now, after the client receives the service challenge, it can choose the challenge response, as well as the send and receive RT4 keys. The client then sends a big blob back to the server containing the following information. A username, the server challenge, the client challenge, and an encrypted challenge response. Uh, which is everything we need, we need to do an offline brute force of the password. I coded up a little project that does this for us. Uh, it just takes in a PCAP and a password list and it'll spit out the username and password. Uh, you can see in this example, I was using the password then. At first, this seems like a toy, but you need to realize that in the real world, this traffic is, uh, flowing over the internet. So, uh, So it's important that just last month, uh, Microtik moved away from this implement implementation in their uh, stable branch. They moved to 6.43, which now uses a curve-based uh, key exchange. Uh, Long-term is still expected, and as I showed earlier, uh, patching is not great on these systems. Now this is not a toy. Uh, this is actually pretty useful for us. Uh, this tool decrypts the contents of a JS proxy session in a PCAP and it writes uh, the, mess the decrypted messages to standard out. Uh, this is an example from 6.32.3, and we find underneath the RC4 encryption uh, JSON-based message system. But the protocol here isn't obviously anything, at least it wasn't to me, um, so I had to dig into it. We see each JSON key value pair is broken down into three parts. Uh, in the first part, the first character defines the type, of which there are 14 different types, and I've listed them all here. Uh, the second part is a hex integer, and it represents the name. And finally, part three is the value. Now combined, these three things describe a variable. In, this, in, in the example in the slide, you can see that the first variable starts with a capital U, which means a 32-bit array. It has a name of FF0001, and an array value of 13.7. Furthermore, the protocol has some built-in or known variable types. For example, uh, uppercase U FF0001 from the previous example stands for system 2, and lowercase U FF0007 stands for command. Uh, I've listed some of the other built-ins in this slide. So hopefully we understand the basics of the format. But obviously we don't understand what any of that means, stuff like system two, like what is that? If we look at the decrypted traffic, there are all sorts of different system two array values. Some have one entry, and some have two entries, and there are all sorts of different numbers. Now there's one line in the JavaScript that gives us a hint. In the example in this slide, the system two is set to this.id underscore fileman and this.id underscore transfer. And it turns out that FileMan is the name of a binary sitting in router OS's file system within Nova Flash Bin. Now, in my own bug hunting journey, uh, a good deal of time passed before I stumbled upon this. But eventually, I found the system.x3 file used by the Nova Flash Bin slash loader binary. This, fin this caught my attention finally, uh, because it lists all the other Nova Flash Bin binaries in it and there's some type of pattern. So I just started pulling it apart. In this slide, I pulled, apart, I pulled out a single entry from the system.x3 file. Uh, and this entry is for nova slash bin slash log. Each entry has a, is associated with an ASCII number. Uh, for example, you can see that nova slash bin slash log appears to be associated with the number three. I've highlighted that in yellow. Uh, so is it possible that three is the log, is log system two number? So pictured here is some decrypted traffic where the system.2 starts with a three. Uh, the contents of this traffic, the, the contents of this traffic is the router OS log file. You can clearly see a number of uh, user admin logged in entries. So I would say it appears that the system three file does map the uh, system two mapping. Fortunately, no one needs to parse this X3 by hand because I wrote a tool to do it. Uh, X3 parts will take in uh, system.x3 file and spit out all the system mapping. 
And from what I've observed, these mappings don't really change across versions. Uh, it's more likely that new mappings are added as Microsoft rolls out new features. Now, some of you observant people might be thinking, what about the forward? If you didn't notice, in the previous log example, the system view array had two numbers in it, a three, which we've learned is associated with a binary, specifically the log binary, and a four, which I totally ignored. On the left side of on the left side of the slide, you'll see a screenshot from Nova slash bin slash log in Ida. You should notice that the repeated calls to add handler associated with a number and a handler pointer. You're now looking at the second number in the system two array. Now a handler is an object that handles different commands sent to it. On the right, you can see handler number four in the Nova slash bin slash log binary. Messages with a system two of three, four are handled by this object. Now an obvious question at this point is how many system two endpoints in router OS are there? Do we have to manually map them? Um, the answer is no, we don't. I wrote a binary ninja script that will do it for us. The script takes in a directory of binaries, uh, ideally Nova slash bin, and spits out the handler numbers associated with each binary. The screenshot in this slide shows the handler numbers for the first few process binaries. Uh, you can see some of the binaries just have one handler, and others it doesn't. And there appears to be no real rhyme or reason to how the handlers are numbered. So let's go back to the original example. We now know exactly what the system2 array means. For this message, uh, this for the seventh handler and the binary that is mapped to 13 which happens to be Nova slash bin slash user. But now what does the number and the command variable mean? Fortunately, thanks to a very useful debugging functions in libu message, uh, finding the fan mappings was probably the easiest thing I did. I've listed the known ones here. We can see that the command provided in the example is o by se o o o d for the git command. Now I want to draw your attention to the red text in the right hand corner. It's actually really important to understand what an unknown command is. An unknown command is any value not listed in this slide. Handlers that use unknown commands have to implement their own functionality for processing those commands. Now you're probably thinking, this is all sort of making, making sense, so we'll probably start talking about bugs soon. Uh, but you're wrong. Because Microtech switched the HTTP interface from the JSON message format over to a binary format. Uh, so why present the JSON format at all? Well, I really like the JSON format. Once you understand it, it's simple to read. Uh, also, Microtech didn't, didn't remove the functionality. You can still talk JSON just fine to the HTTP server, uh, but by default, it wants to talk binary to you. Uh, but it's not all bad. The underlying message protocol is the same. It's just formatted a little bit differently. In this slide, you see I've mapped the type name and value in both formats. Now, unlike the JSON version, which relies on delimiters, the binary version needs length fields. So every message starts off with a one byte length, one byte packet length, a security mode flag, two bytes of total message length, and then the magic M2. All that is finally followed by the actual message data. Note that the data in this slide is, a, is as it appears on the wire, as in I copied and pasted it straight, straight from Wireshark. Uh, so we'll be flipping some of the fields when we talk about how they're actually constructed. Uh, so similar to the JSON version, types and names are merged into one field. In the binary format, they're merged into a four byte value, with the highest eight bits of the type and the lowest 24 bits of the variable name. Just like the JSON format, there are 14 different types of variables, and in fact, they are the exact same uh, variable types found in the JSON format. In this slide, you'll see a stack of the different versions so they're easier to compare. Boolean values are sort of unique in how they're encoded, and that the type field doubles as the value. A type of 01 is true, and a type of 00 is false. The variables that describe integers contain four bytes of integer data, unless a short bit is set. In that case, only one byte of data will follow the variable name. The short bit is the lowest bit in the type field. 
you can see in the slide an integer variable normally has a type of 8, but when the short bit is set, it has a type of 9. Now, similar to the previous example, the short bit controls the size of the length field in the string variable. Normally, a string's length is 2 bytes, but with the short bit set, the field is just 1 byte. And the message type is literally messages embedded in the current message, which means that you're going to see the preamble again. Uh, here you can see the M2 right there in the middle, 4032. And again, you can see the length field is controlled by a short bit. Uh, kind of a funny side note that I'm the only one that's ever laughed at it, I think. Uh, CVE 2018-1158 describes how MicroTix JSON parser makes unbounded recursive calls to handle embedded messages. If a message recurses deep enough, an attacker triggers stack overflow, the system would reboot. I was the one that actually reported that vulnerability. As you can see, I've written a fair amount of code for this project. Uh, so the funny part is that uh, this bug still exists in my code. Now, the length field in an array variable actually describes the number of entries in the array. This slide's example of a length is 62, and the length is followed by two 32-bit entries. That's because the variable's type is a 32-bit array. So two entries gives us two 32-bit arrays. Now, I'm impressed these guys have hung on this long. I'm done describing the protocol field. I won't be mapping JSON on the binary anymore. Uh, we're getting close to the good stuff. Uh, Microtik offers a fixed client for router configuration called Winbox, and it communicates on 8291. And as it turns out, it uses the binary message protocol that I just described. So I wasn't totally wasting your time. You now know how to talk to both HTTP and the Winbox port. And of course, I had to write a parser for Winbox as well. So similar to the HTTP parser, this tool takes in the TCAP and spits out the messages in JSON format. Now, Talos just released a Wireshark detector with similar functionality just a week ago. Um, so, thanks, guys. Now, knowing the message protocol is truly fundamental to bug hunting in router OS. Now that you know how to form the system, now you know what system 2 means, how handlers work, and how to format messages. You can reach any of these binaries in Nova Flash Bin, which, as you can see, is a pretty large attack surface. Uh, and I know what you're thinking. This guy titled his talk Bug Hunting in Router OS uh, doesn't present a single damn bug in the first 30 minutes. Well, you finally made it. I'm not done talking about protocol junk, uh, not by a long shot, but we're ready to talk about three different bugs. You can see on the left uh, a stack overflow in the life of the upgrade binary. This vulnerability can be triggered remotely through Winbox or HTTP, but it requires authentication. I reported this vulnerability in late May, and MicroTik released the patch in August. Now, one of the ways I like to start bug hunting uh, ELF binaries, and I know a lot of other people do this, is I just look at the imports and find any known bad functions. Stuff like system, the exec, functions, printf, or copies, whatever. When I was looking at the license upgrade binary, I found this printf being used to form an HTTP get request. Now, obviously, at this point in the investigation, I have no clue if I can control any of these parameters, but it looks pretty interesting. Uh, the username and password parameters really stick out to me. So let's figure out where those values come from and if we can control them. Libview message has a whole bunch of helper functions for pulling variables out of messages. On this slide, we can see two has functions looking for two string IDs, string ID 1 and string ID 2. We can also see that if the has function fail, the string's no username and no password get pushed onto the stack. So clearly, string 1 is the username and string 2 is the password. When I see these types of message functions, uh, I generally assume that I can pick this code over the network and that I have control of the contents. So if that's the case, we just need to figure out how we can actually reach this code. The first step to figuring out how to reach the sprint app is to figure out the system tool array. Using the X3 parse tool we discussed earlier, 
we know that the license upgrade binary system number is 55. So the question is, what's the handler number? Following the XREST in IDA upwards, we eventually arrive to an unknown command function and the handler pictured in this slide. Now this handler is part of the main looper construction, and it isn't ad added using add handler. So there's no special, or hand no special handler ID for this object. So to send a message to this handler, we simply use an array with one entry of 55. So we know the system2 array, but now we need to know the commands to send in order to reach the sprint desk. This handler's implementation of the unknown command function is basically a switch statement on the command value. In the IDA screenshot in this slide, you can see two cases, one and four, that lead down to the function that calls sprint desk. So we should be fine using either commands one or four in the message protocol command variable. The very last part uh, to reach this code is we just need to collect the remaining parameters we might need to correctly traverse the code path. In the previous slide, there was a bool variable with an ID of seven. Pictured in this slide are two N32s being extracted from the message ID three and ID six. But I don't really see any of these being used until after the sprint death uh, is hit, so we probably don't need uh, anything specific in there for our purposes. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see a full message we want to send in JSON. But before we test that message, can we hit the sprint app without authentication? Sure, I told you earlier that CVE 2018-1156 requires authentication, but I didn't offer any evidence either. So here's some evidence. I've learned that every unknown command is assigned a policy. In this slide screenshot, you can see commands 1 through 6 being assigned a policy of 200 hex. What exactly does that mean? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But what I do know is that commands that don't require auth, uh, they have a policy of zero. And as such, none of the license upgrade unknown commands uh, are unauthenticated. So now we have everything we need to write a proof of concept. And I'd like to highlight a few things in the screenshot on the right. As part of this project, I wrote a message implementation to make creating, sending, and receiving messages easy. You can see in the POC that message construction is just a series of function calls, um, and all the formatting is handled for you. Also note how simple it is to serialize message to JSON. This POC also relies on a JS proxy session class, uh, that handles all the authentication and session logic. You can also see that I've shoved 512 bytes of the letter A in the username field and the password field. So this POC will trigger the stack overflow. Now it's kind of tedious to look up every single handler and discover the command, by po the command policy by end. So uh, I wrote a tool that does this automatically. It takes in the X3 parser output and uh, the find handlers output, and it sends get policy requests to every single handler in the system. When the script is finished running, we've mapped out the entire attack surface of the Nova slash bin directory for the message protocol. We also have a really clear picture of how many commands can be invoked without authentication. Um, and I believe that number is around 17 different commands. So let's talk about a bug being actively exploited in the wild. CVE 2018-14-847 is being used to obtain the admin credentials to route our OS system. Attackers have used those credentials to insert CoinHive JavaScript into 404 pages, proxy network traffic, and who knows what else. But I couldn't find any good write-ups on the bug itself. The CVE entries description simply says this. Wimbox for MicroTik router OS through 6.42 allows remote attackers to bypass authentication and read arbitrary files by modifying a request to change one byte related to the session ID. Now, if that doesn't make any sense to any of you, well, it doesn't make any sense to me. But luckily, there are, there are a few implementations on Exploit TV. I think they're largely copy and paste of each other. Um, but they all use the same text blog. Um, but it's really unclear what that hex blob means. So let's check that out. Using our newly acquired knowledge of the Winbox protocol, we can simply convert the first blob to a much easier to read JSON format. 
We can see the system two arrays is the binary number two and handler number two. And furthermore, the command being used is seven. And we do see that there is directory traversal to the user.dat file, which does contain the system's usernames and passwords. So let's keep looking. Using the X3 parser, we can quickly determine that binary number two is actually Nova slash bin slash seven proxy. Furthermore, we can quickly find handler number two by, finding, by following an add handler call in mcross and locating the unknown function implement, implementation that command 7 drops down into. So what does command 7 actually do? All it does is open an, an, open an existing file in home slash web slash webfig for reading. Now mcross replies to the client with a session ID and size of the open file. Unpictured here is the logic that checks for directory traversal. Uh, it's actually really large, it's convoluted, uh, it doesn't fit into a slide. And since we're actually talking about the CV, CVE, it obviously doesn't work. So the first payload makes sense. It opens the user.dat file for reading. So what does the second payload do? Again, we see the system2 array is mproxy handler number 2. The command is now 4. The request ID has been incremented, and the session ID now is here. There's also a new U2 variable. So what does this command 4 do? Unsurprisingly, it reads from the file open in the command 7. It reads the amount requested in the U2 variable. In this case, it shows the hard-coded U2 to 32,768. And mproxy reads the file data and sends it back to the requester. And that is all there is to CVE 2018-14847. And it's actually really simple. Um, but I didn't really like the hex blob implementation, so I rewrote a POC using my message implementation and a Winbox session class. Uh, to me, this is just easier to understand. And one thing you'll notice is that we never talked about authentication. If the CV's description clearly says bypass authentication. Using the policy discovery tool we talked about earlier, it's clear that commands 4 and 7 don't require authentication at all. Actually, the CV's description is pretty confused all around. Uh, so last night I actually sent an updated description off the MITRE. Uh, and by the way, since we're already here, why don't we just check out the other unknown commands for handler 2? After poking around a bit, I found that commands 1 through 7 do the following. 1 opens a file, 2 writes to the open file, opens a file for writing, 2 writes to that file. 3 opens a file for reading, and 4 reads the open file. 5 cancels the transfer and deletes the file. 6 creates a directory in var slash package, and as we know, 7 opens a file for reading. Now, is any of that useful or interesting to us? Most of those new commands require authentication. None of us really care because we're big time hackers and we don't care about on off our CV. But just hold on. Just remember that CVE 2018-14847 allows us to read the user.dat file and steal credentials. So we can hit pretty much any code path without knowing the credits beforehand. So that leaves me wondering, does the directory traversal exist for any other commands? In the IDA screenshot to the right, you see that the directory traversal function, which I creatively named check directory traversal, is shared by commands 1, 3, and 7. Both commands 3 and 7 open files for reading, so it's pretty exciting. But command 1 opens files for writing. So obviously writing is new functionality for us. What do we want to write? Do we overwrite user.dat? Maybe we write an init script? or maybe there's a cron on the system we can take advantage of. Or we could just write the developer backdoor file, which I think works quite nicely. I've written up a proof of concept that does this. Uh, first steals the credentials, and then creates backdoor files. That gives a remote unauthenticated attacker a root terminal on the device, which is pretty sweet for a device that doesn't want to give us any type of shell at all. Note that, thankfully, since CVE 2018-14847 was patched in April, this too is patched. But patching is slow. 
And as of September 30th, again based on FCC banners, uh, nearly 70% of the internet facing microchip routers remain vulnerable to this remote, remote routing technique. Uh, and that's a couple hundred thousand routers. Now here's a little screenshot of me attempting to log in as developed to a MIPS-based router board device that I've had in my home forever. After failing to log in, I then run the exploit and try to log in again, and I get my shell. That's all I have for you today. Okay. Does anyone actually have any questions? No? Okay. Uh, how is it working with Microtech? Um, so the last time I spoke to Microtech was during the August patches. Um, and they're fine. They're not super communicative, but that's most companies. Uh, I think there was a small language barrier, but it was generally okay. How pissed were they when they figured out when you when they figure out that you knew about their developer backdoor? Um, I'm not actually the first that figured that out. I've extended that. Um, it doesn't seem to be that they're hiding it at all. It's uh, fairly obvious. My if you're looking for it. Thanks, everyone.